Hi, my name is Chris Long, and I'm president and founder of the Center for Public Policy Innovation, a nonprofit think tank whose mission is to assist government officials in addressing the many challenges and issues brought on by the rapid advancement of technology. I'm joined today by John Backus, co-founder and general manager of the Proof Venture Capital Fund, and John's also a member of CPPI's board of directors. John is a successful venture capitalist. He's been part of the startup and technology ecosystem for over 30 years. He's helped launch a number of highly recognizable businesses, including Epic Games, Masterclass, Beyond Meat, 2B, Sweet Green Bird, and others. He's an expert on new business formation and industry and jobs creation, global competition, and the future of the American technology economy. Welcome, John, and thanks for being here. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Well, over the last few years, we've seen some major new business trends emerge from industry and, and from government. And this has been accelerated by the response to the COVID pandemic. You know, the private sector, you know, quickly adapted to new communications tools to facilitate, you know, meetings, education, healthcare, e-commerce. We also saw a workforce realignment and a wave of new startups. You know, at the same time, the government's response was to invest trillions of dollars to support workers in the economy, invest in the digital transformation of business, and reinvest in a modern infrastructure, and uh, to invest in critical industries back home, such as semiconductors, you know, insourcing. So I guess my first question, just to start off, is I, I think a great place to begin this discuss, discussion is to look at the venture capital and startup ecosystem. You know, where have we been traditionally, John, and 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 where are we going? Can you share sure. some thoughts? Yeah. yeah. So 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 a bit of background. So venture capital is a relatively small asset class. So the venture capital industry deploys you know, two to $300 billion of private capital a year uh, into about 7,000 new companies and about 10,000 additional companies that raise additional capital. Uh, U.S. venture-backed startups account for a majority of companies that go public in the U.S. on both the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. So they're responsible for creating a lot of value in the ecosystem. Uh, Young companies, uh, not necessarily venture back, but most are venture back, create almost all of the jobs in America. The Kauffman Foundation did a study many years ago that showed, I believe it was over the last couple of decades, that all net U.S. job growth came from businesses that were less than five years old. That's an interesting thing to think about. You know, it means that as policymakers, we should really try to figure out how do we foster uh, new business creation? Because if new businesses create jobs, we want to foster new business creation every which way we can. So venture is a private tool, a private capital tool that is used to help startups uh, pursue an idea uh, and help companies that have passed the startup stage but are still relatively young grow faster than they might otherwise without that additional capital. About 20 years ago, the U.S. had about 95% of all venture-backed startups in the world. Today, the U.S. is about 50% of all venture-backed startups. It's not because number of startups in the U.S. has shrunk or the amount of dollars going into startups in the U.S. has shrunk. It's because the rest of the world has woken up to the idea that once was sort of a, a, a U.S. province, which is... Uh, you know, you, you you know, venture capital backed companies create jobs and create technological innovation. So the rest of the world is caught up. You know, it's no longer a uniquely American thing. I think that's good for the world and good for technology. But, you know, we can't take our eye off the ball. We have to do everything we can to encourage this ecosystem. And, and frankly, I haven't met an elected official yet that didn't want more venture capital, uh, more startup companies and more jobs in their locale. So John, that's very interesting. Um, could you talk to us a little about China's role in the global economy and in the venture capital ecosystem? Sure. So, you know, China is now number two behind the United States 
in terms of number of venture-backed companies and dollars that flow to those companies. Uh, you know, it, it really did nothing in venture 20 years ago. So it's come out of nowhere to, you know, to, to you know, be at the point where it's creating a lot of businesses, it's funding a lot of technology. And, uh, you know, I, I, that's good, you know, in a sense, but, you know, China and technology and competitiveness is really a double-edged sword. You know, on the good side, you know, you've got capital that's flowing to innovation. Innovation, you know, in, in the end becomes a global good. You know, and, and if something's invented in one country, it's often used around the world if it's a, you know, a, a better, faster, cheaper technology. You know, on the other hand, China plays by its own set of rules. It doesn't play by the same rule book that we play by. Uh, you know, you look at, you know, in the U.S., for example, there were 300,000 Chinese students at U.S. universities and U.S. universities love this because they pay full boat. You know, they were paying those 300,000 students just if you assume 50,000 a year, you know, out of state or out of country tuition. It's actually a lot higher in most places. That's 15 billion a year, you know, that's coming into the U.S. economy. The problem is that 20, 30 years ago, most students coming from China were coming for an education. Many of them stayed, you know, in the U.S. Now, a lot of the people coming from China have a second agenda, and it's a government-driven agenda, which is to uh, find intellectual property, either in a research lab in a university, or by going to work for a young technology company, or even a mature technology company, and exfiltrate that information back to China. I've had a couple of interesting briefings on Capitol Hill you know, about this problem, and it's a real problem. And it's it's one that it's hard to it's hard to figure out how we solve that problem. There's no master database of people that you know companies shouldn't recruit or shouldn't be allowed to work in a research lab. I think that's a missing opportunity for the U.S. because you know if if the government could share with the private sector and the academic sector, uh, you know, list of suspicious people, I think I think that'd be helpful for us, quite frankly, but. You know, the issue with China goes well beyond uh, students, you know, coming into coming into the university. You know, the issue really gets to a competitiveness issue. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you look at what we've seen over the last couple of years with COVID. Uh, we have supply chain issues. You know, we found out during COVID that a lot of our PPE was made in China. And when the pandemic hit, you know, uh, China effectively monopolized a lot of that production for a period of time. They kept it for themselves. Even if it was a U.S. factory and a U.S. company uh, creating this, they kept it to themselves. We worried about, during the pandemic, the number of generic drugs, antibiotics, for example, that are made exclusively in China. And we worried about that as a country. And today, as we look at uh, advancing to a cleaner energy economy, I think we've woken up and figured out that, you know, rare earth minerals are almost the exclusive province of China, as well as countries in Africa, particularly where China has basically obtained the mineral rights. And, you know, as a country 20, 30 years ago, we decided it was too dirty and it polluted too much to create and mine those rare earth minerals in the U.S. So we kind of looked the other way and said it's okay if this pollution happens in another country, you know. But now we're now we're at a point where I think we need to decide uh, how we insource that rare earth mineral production again that we're going to need for electric cars, batteries, and beyond, because we can do it cleaner that it can be done elsewhere in the world. And it's, you know, frankly, a bit arrogant to say, you know, it's too dirty for us to produce, but we're going to buy it from a country that produces it, you know, in an even dirtier fashion. So I think that's a, a strategic need that, that we need to address. I, I think we're going to see an insourcing uh, of technologies and production and products. We've seen that with a couple of our venture-backed companies where they had manufacturing in China. And a lot of those companies are, you know, not, not completely eliminating what they're doing in China, but they're balancing their production into different countries, including the United States. And I think that's a good thing. 
Uh, all, all great points, John. Thank you. <clears throat> can you take? Um, can you talk a moment about workforce issues and the those the importance of these issues to a startup community and a venture capital ecosystem? Sure. You know, I mean, talent and workforce is the lifeblood of any company but particularly a technology-based startup company. You know, we have a challenge in the U.S. because most people who go to college don't get a STEM degree. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. Most students are still getting liberal arts degrees, and we have a surplus of people with liberal arts degrees and a shortage of people with STEM degrees. Historically, you know, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you know, the U.S. was the magnet in the world to attract the best and the brightest talent looking for a great education. We attracted the best and the brightest from, you know, from all over the world, you know, from India, from China, from Europe, from Latin America, you know, from the rest of Asia. You know, we still do that to some degree today. The difference is, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, people would come here for an education. They would stay here. They would start a company. Uh, they would create value in our economy. And after 9-11 happened, we had a total mindset shift. You know, we pretty much said, you know, all these people who are coming here for an education, that's great, but we're going to send them back, you know, as soon as they graduate, which frankly is one of the dumbest things you can think of. We should do everything we can to have, you know, a talent drain into America you know, from the rest of the world. And if people are coming here anyway to get an education, you know, we should do everything we can uh, to, to have these people use their brain power to help create businesses and jobs in America. And this is not, it's not a new idea that I have. This is something that, you know, has and had bipartisan support. We can remember, gosh, what was it, 15, 20 years ago, you know, Mitt Romney talked about stapling a visa you know, to the degrees of people coming out of college and graduate school with a STEM degree. Barack Obama, when he was president, you know, in the early 2010s, uh, uh, was talking about the startup visa. You know, unfortunately, it was never signed into law. It's something with bipartisan support, but it continually gets trapped in a broader set of immigration issues. And, you know, uh, it was looking to be done by executive action by Obama and then Trump decided to pull it back and not do it. And, you know, we're hoping something can actually pass legislatively as opposed to executive action, which can be like a ping pong ball, depending on, you know, who, which administration is in power. And the simple idea of that is, you know, if you come here from a different country, uh, you get an education, and if you're going to start a business and you raise a certain amount of capital or you hire a certain number of people, you automatically get a visa. And it's not a lifetime visa, but it's a visa for you to build that business here in America. So those are simple things that I think we can and should do that, that frankly, you know, enjoy bipartisan support. Yeah, well, that's a great answer, John. A lot, lot, lot there. Thank you. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, during COVID that we, we saw enormous uh, contraction of the workforce as people isolated uh, uh, themselves at home. You know, and traditionally, this kind of a workforce disruption does see a, a rise in startups. Can you share your thoughts about, you know, this and some other trends, some of the current trends impacting entrepreneurs out there? Sure. So I, I think uh, one of the most interesting trends was was first identified uh, pre-COVID by Steve Case, you know, the, the founder of AOL. You know, Steve now runs uh, Revolution Ventures that has both a seed stage fund, an early stage fund, and a growth stage fund. And Steve's premise was that technology companies don't just have to be born in New York and Boston and Silicon Valley, that they can and should be born and fostered everywhere in the United States, in all 50 states because there isn't a shortage of entrepreneurial ideas in the rest of the country. You know, there has been a shortage of capital because the capital historically has come out of those three areas, Silicon Valley, Boston, and New York, because that's where most of the startups were historically. So 
what COVID did was accelerate a trend that was already happening, which I'm going to call the democratization of capital or the democratization of startups. You know, we're now seeing companies getting an equal chance to start up and to be successful. You know, if they're in Des Moines, Iowa, you know, or Green Bay, Wisconsin, you know, just as they are in Silicon Valley. And that's a good thing. I think it's a trend that we want to see continue. And, you know, to do that, we're going to have to provide support infrastructure to these young fund managers, because, you know, uh, if, if you're a young company in Des Moines, Iowa, you don't know how to reach out to a capital network in Silicon Valley or New York or Boston, and you shouldn't have to know that. So what we want to do is figure out how do we foster, you know, venture capital funds to start up in different parts of the country? Because the earliest capital that a company raises is going to be local. It's not going to come from thousands of miles away. And to do that, you know, we want to, you know, make sure that we don't penalize, you know, small companies or penalize small venture funds. And most small venture funds these days, you know, that you have a lot more small venture funds that are started by, you know, non-traditional VCs, you know, you, you, we want to have more uh, venture funds started by women, started by people of color. And we're seeing a lot of that, not necessarily on the coast as much, but in the rest of the country. So I think there's a, there's a real desire, both in the industry and from policymakers to spread what we do in venture capital to all 50 states. John, I have thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you today, but before we sign off, um, can you please share with us any parting thoughts you might have, have with us, anything you'd like us to take away from today's discussion? Sure. Uh, you know, when you think about making policy, think about the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And, and a thought for you is that small companies don't spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C., they don't have lobbyists. They don't come down and talk to elected officials or staff. They probably should, but they are focused 100% on building their business and trying to manage what, what generally is a fast-growing business. So policy often gets made you know, based on the desires of large technology companies, and I'm talking about the technology arena right now, that you know, have access to people on Capitol Hill. The small companies don't. You know, the real, really the only voice that they have is through the National Venture Capital Association, which is a great group. I was on their board many, many years ago. Uh, and that's really the voice for entrepreneurship. And I would just encourage all policymakers, uh, as you think about making policy uh, that might impact the technology industry, you know, first, obviously, do no harm. You know, second, try to figure out ways to you know, make what we do more effective and think about the little guy, because you go back to that report from the Kauffman Foundation, if net job creation comes from young companies, we really need to make sure they have a voice at the table. So that's the thought I'd leave people with. That's uh, great advice, John. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Chris.